that gives you an idea of what it's like to read something that is input, yet may not be comprehensible input, starting with this. Now, this passage that I'm showing you is actually written for an, a third grader, a third grade native speaking student. And this passage is reflective of what it would be like to try to read this passage or this text if your students had already learned the first 1,000 most frequently used words in English. So, you know, there's lots of lists out there um, that people use for that determination to teach vocabulary. And so you can see if you have learned the first most thousand frequent words in English, you have about 80% word knowledge for this text. So every word that I've X'd out is a word that's beyond the first thousand words. This is what it would be like to know 80, if you knew 80% of the words in this text. Now, one thing I wanna keep in mind that's a big difference between us and our students, for example, trying to read this text. We are adults and we're already educated. For students trying to read this text, it would be incredibly difficult and that's because they are still learning the content. But for us, we can look at it and go, okay, I have an idea of what this is about. I don't really know the details, but I have some idea. So let's move to another level of vocabulary coverage. Now, if your students had learned the, the first 2,000 most frequently used words in the English language, they would now have a coverage of about 85%. So notice another thousand words in terms of word frequency has not made that much difference in this text. That's something really important to recognize, and that's because word frequency is often um, reflective of function words. So when we see high frequency words, they're often function words, not necessarily content words um, that are found in texts over and over. Um, and the one thing I wanna point out on this one, so you can see I've brought in the words that now you know because you know another thousand words, so swinging, pattern, swing, slowly, those words come in, but I, I highlighted the word top for a really important reason. And that's because students may know the word top um, as top versus bottom, but in this case, this is the reference to the word top, which is certainly not the primary meaning of the word. It's secondary, maybe even tertiary. And so you can see how just knowing a word in one context is not enough, even for a text like this. And then I wanna move one step further to show you what it's like if you know the first 5,000 highest frequency, frequently used words in English. So now you have coverage of 95%, and that means you already know 95% of the words in this text when you go to read it. Notice the difference. Notice you now have a real sense of what this text is about. In fact, you could be tested on this and do really well. What I have up in the upper right-hand corner is the words that in fact are not still covered in the first 5,000 words. And you'll notice that with the exception of that word tetherball, those words are really words that would be key words in a typical text for students in a science class. So they'd be words that would be taught as part of the lesson. But the reason um, I, I wanted to show you this is you can see the difference in how much you can learn from a passage, from a text, if you know enough words. And that's really what we need to know here, because this, again, is research that we're going to apply as we show you what we use with Renaissance. The last thing before I move off this slide is I want to show you that this is what a tetherball is because candidly, that is a seriously low frequency word. And in all honesty, I did not know what that word was. <laughs> so I just have to share that with you. I would have had to look that word up, and in fact, I did. <clears throat> so I ask you to keep in mind, at what point is a text comprehensible? It's really important to know, because if it's not comprehensible, then you have to ask yourself, is the student learning? And since I am going on the assumption that most of you are um, second language learners of English, I don't know that, but I assume that. I am a second language learner of French, for example. I can tell you that I personally, throughout my language learning uh, experiences, spent so much time 
with texts, and I started as a child, with texts that I did not understand. And the way I was expected to understand it was to sit with a dictionary. And for me personally, I'll just share you my bias. That's not reading. It's painful. It's time consuming. It's looking up words, but it's not real reading. And I think what we want to do is provide our students with texts that are comprehensible so that they, in fact, will learn from them. So to do that, we need to know how many words they actually have to know to understand a text. And what the research tells us is really clear. And I will share with you, this is for native speakers and non-native speakers. The truth is, you have to already know at least 90% of the words in a text to get something out of the text. That's a really high bar. What's more important about that research, in my opinion, is that when you know less than 80% of the words in a text, you get almost nothing from it, and it's a waste of time. So that to me was really the wake up call. Once I started understanding this research, I had a much better sense of why my language learning experience in French was so painful. I spent all my time with texts that were well beyond my ability. So the question that we have to answer is how do we make text input comprehensible? What do we need to know? So the first thing is the vocabulary coverage that I shared with you. You have to already know at least 90% of the words in a text to have a shot at understanding it. But the second thing that's equally as important is your knowledge about the text itself, your knowledge about the topic. So how much you know about the topic also affects how well you can understand what you're either hearing or reading. In this case, we're talking reading. And I'll I want to share an example with you in my own language learning. And I, I just imagine that, you, that all of you have some example in your own experience of language learning that um, will be able to relate to this. <clears throat> so when I was working on my master's degree, I, I uh, spent time in um, Canada, Quebec, at a university there. So I was, you know, already an adult. I had already studied French for nine years. I already had a bachelor's degree in French before I went there. And, you know, I enrolled in the classes, they tested us for our language level and all of that. And one of the courses I took was the history of Quebecois, uh, the history of, uh, of Quebec, sorry, and Quebec. And so we have this textbook that they gave us and, and, and my guess in hindsight is that this textbook was probably an eighth grade textbook, I'll say that. I'm guessing, knowing what textbooks look like. Um, and it was, it was about the history of Quebec and it was through the centuries. And um, honestly, I mean, I knew a lot of the vocabulary in it. I really thought I was going to be okay with this book in this course. <laughs> and the reality was I knew nothing about the history of Quebec, nothing. And therefore I was unable to read the book. It didn't matter if I looked up the words I didn't know. I didn't have any background knowledge to stick this to. And as a result, that book was way too hard for me. Even though I knew the words, it was the content. So that combination of life experience plus the research said, well, okay, then we at Renaissance can do better in providing um, texts for students who are learning English. We can apply this research so that you can feel good about what it is your students are using to support what you do in the classroom. So the what I want to share with you is Mayan. Through Mayan, I'm going to provide for you examples of, in listening and reading, how to provide comprehensible input to your students so that it will support what your students are doing in your classroom. So <clears throat> remember I started off by choosing the topic transportation at the very beginning of this presentation. And I thought I would carry it through the whole presentation so that there's a storyline that makes sense. Instead of just giving um, random examples, I'm, I'm hoping this will make it uh, make more sense. Um, so it occurred to me as I was um, researching 
for this presentation that the CEFR can do descriptors actually tell you what is comprehensible to a student. It's real interesting that that actually tells you what is comprehensible, which then guides the input that is comprehensible. So looking at the theme transportation, the descriptor for reading for pre-A1, that's the very beginners, is that they can recognize familiar words with pictures. We've all been there. We all know what that's like. And, and if I'm looking at transportation, this would be an example of perhaps a page from a picture dictionary, say it that way. But let's move up. Once a student is past that initial simple single words, um, maybe the verb to be and have, let's say that. Let's move to an A1 student and look at examples of what kind of texts would be comprehensible input to the student at that CEFR level based on the can-do descriptors. So this is the can-do descriptor for reading for a student at A1. And you can see he can understand very short, simple texts, a single phrase at a time, perhaps. This book is an example of that that comes from Ion. Max likes, likes to ride in the bus. Notice it's a very simple present tense sentence. It's not too long. It's just got one prepositional phrase. It's using the verb, the, one of the first verbs taught, likes, gives you likes plus an infinitive. I mean, see how that would be comprehensible to a student at an A1 level. Now, candidly, it could have many more sentences also, but as long as it was limited to that kind of simple short structure, with familiar vocabulary, it would be comprehensible input to um, an English learner at A1. So let's move to A2. A2, notice again, I've got transportation as the topic. I'm staying with that theme. And students at this level can understand short, simple texts with high frequency vocabulary. So this book is an example of how you would support a student at that level. Although the vocabulary is very simple, we're going to buy you a bike, said mom. In fact, the grammatical structure is a little more complex. You can see here that they've moved to the present progressive tense. We've got direct address. Um, those are things that make it a little more complex and move up on the language learning scale. Uh, they have bike instead of bicycle. You may have been taught bicycle or bike, we don't know, but you can see how this would be comprehensible text to a student at this level. And again, as you move through the book, there's all kinds of other language used, but it's on this topic and it's at this level. Let's go to A2 plus because some of the um, Cambridge sites, uh, the European sites actually have an A2 plus listed to separate between the A's and the B's. Um, this is where a student can understand short, simple text on familiar matters of a concrete type. And you can see it's not just now high frequency language, but school related language. And here you can see this is a, a more complex sentence. Many people in your community have jobs helping others. What do bus drivers do? It's more language. It's more complex grammatically, but it's still using high frequency everyday words. And you can see, excuse me, you can see how that will move a student from where they are now to moving them up. So each of these is more complex as we move along. It's not just more vocabulary, but it's more complexity. And the, the structure that I like to point out on this one is the, the word helping. You know, that's a really um, low frequency grammatical structure for English, for native English speakers. Um, another way to say that would be many people in your community, community have jobs that help others. So you can see it, um, it, there are different ways to do that. And usually the ING form does not come up front. It's usually followed by the other structures that we learn. Okay, now we're gonna to move to the Bs. And once we get here, you can see once again, there really is more language and there's lower frequency vocabulary. So a student at B1 can read straightforward factual texts on subjects related, you can see that to his or her interest. And this one, if you start to look at the vocabulary on here, you see how it's truly building on what's previous been, been learned but boy, the vocabulary starts to get more complex. And, and I have to actually say, it, it's not really that it's more complex, it's, more, it's lower frequency. So to ride a bike, push the pedals with your feet. 
um, pedals is a word that is not a high frequency word. Cog, heavenly. I mean, that is not a high frequency word. And even chain. So you can see these are words that are probably not on somebody's list of words to study. But by pro uh, providing this kind of um, comprehensible input to your students, they will build that low frequency vocabulary and low frequency structure. The thing I want to say about this one in terms of structure is to ride a bike, comma, is a really lower frequency structure also in English, starting with a prepositional phrase, you know, and then with push the pedals, the implied you push the pedals, right? Um, the imperative. Notice those are really structures that were taught in a classroom, but how to combine them like a native speaker. What does it sound like when it's um, typical to a native speaker is the kind of input that you can get when you move up to authentic books like these. All right, and then finally I'll hit the B2 because that's the level that we were talking about that is really where you want to see your students land for the most opportunity. Again, we're still talking about transportation. Here comes the bus. Students at this level can read correspondence relating to his or her field of interest. That's what matters. And they can grasp all the essential meaning. And that is what we want for our students. So they're big, yellow, and fun to ride. This sounds like really easy language, and it is. But it's got a lot more vocabulary in it that, again, is tough for students to get out of a, a vocabulary list. For example, school buses pick kids up that phrasal verb in there, pick up, with the kids in between. Knowing where to put the, the object is a really challenging thing when you try to teach that structure directly. But by giving examples in authentic books, students learn what sounds right to a native speaker, and therefore they now know that's the way it's, it's done by native speakers. And all of these are really important opportunities for students to be able to engage with not only non-native speakers, but native speakers in their careers in the future. So let's go one step further, and I'll move a little bit more quickly so we'll have time for questions. Um, what if we move to low frequency vocabulary? What if we're talking the students past that where this is, they have this kind of vocabulary to engage with, and this is still the theme of transportation. Now I wanna show you books, and I wanna show you that, you know, I actually, Mayan has reading levels that will let, um, in the near future connect to CEFR levels. But I just wanna give you a brief run through of what this might look like to move to lower frequency vocabulary, but still not take it beyond what the student can understand because comprehensibility is everything in terms of growing language. So here's one of the pages from this. Trucks have big engines, they often, often use diesel fuel. You know, diesel, really, really low frequency word. Not that it's complex in terms of structure, but vocabulary. Notice now how we're taking it to that level. This book in the back of it has a glossary that it shows you, in fact, the keywords that would be taught in this um, book. You can see this is much more complex language without, in fact, going into high, high complex grammatical structure. It also comes with critical thinking questions at the end of this book. And that's important for then taking the students from the ability to simply do input where they're listening and reading to in fact productive skills where you can have them practice speaking, engaging with each other and, and writing. So those are really important things that I wanted to share with you. And these are all things that come with these books that I'm sharing. This one is ships. Again, look at the rudder, rudder, low frequency word. It helps steer the ship, steer, really low frequency word. Again, it has a glossary and you can see the level of vocabulary that a student would get. You can also imagine at this point that if students love this topic and are reading sequentially through the reading levels, that you can see how this will help them build vocabulary and the structure with which to use that vocabulary. Again, critical questions. I'm, I'm moving up in reading level. This one is uh, Big Machines Fly. Um, you can see this is not like it looks like a really higher level book, but the language demands are in fact higher. And again, consider cons uh, sequential reading. So hot air balloons use air to fly. A flame heats up the air that expands. You can see these are really moving from low frequency words to in fact academic words that are really important for the future of using uh, this language in a career. 
Again, a glossary. You can see the words repeating over and over. You can see when you stay on theme how that happens. I'm moving one more, a higher level book. This one is a car. I went to cargo ships, wanted to look at something like that for transportation. Um, again, a student that has this kind of language can engage in a, in a career. Um, there's the glossary. There's a, this quiz looks like this following this book. Finally, I, I think I have just one more book to show you, um, and freight trains, and this, oh no, I have one other one. Uh, I can't remember. <laughs> but anyway, this one is, is you know, um, kind of like a historical look at it. Um, and the reason this one is a really important book, I think, is because this one is not written in the present tense. The other books I showed you so far are generally written in the, were generally written in the present tense. This one works really with the past tense a lot. And I only showed you that one slide because that makes the point and I know you understand it, but again, notice how cargo keeps coming up, engine, diesel. See, these are the same words because it is across a theme. Oh yeah, I did have one more. And this one again is uh, in the past tense because it's a history book. Um, and I just, I wanted to share these things with you again, cargo, diesel, you know, drone, remember I showed you that. Um, these are all words that would be used for, that someone would need to function in a career like that. Um, more examples to read. I wanted to give you one more example of the kind of comprehensible input we could give again for the same topic. And this comes from another product that we have called Mayan News. And Mayan News is, is really, part, it's, it's excellent. It's my favorite. <laughs> I read it all the time. I have to say that as a native speaker, I read it all the time. But I wanted to share you these topics are again related to the same theme. So with respect to vocabulary, I guess my point comes down to this. More is always better, but it's not enough just to know more words. Lists of words don't, don't necessarily always help us know how to use those words. And in fact, I find that the words that I pick up from a list um, and use when I'm trying to use my French, I usually use them wrong, to be totally honest. It's really important that we have access to learning that vocabulary in context. And I want to share one other way that you can um, use Mayan with students who are learning English. So previously, what I showed you is an example of how you would do this thematically. So if you have, you know, a theme that you're working in and you want to stick with that, you can do that. Or if you have students who are just enamored with a specific topic, it's really, really useful that way. But when you're talking a big class or class of students, another way to do it is not thematically, but to read across themes. So all of these themes I have up here, I could have done the same exact samples for you. I could have chosen books to do the same exact uh, process. Um, I wanted to share that with you. There are more, but I wanted these to be uh, up here as examples because these are common themes in language textbooks. So now I want to start to wrap up by going the why. You know, we get the why. You get the why, we get the why. This is all about what our students will be able to do in the future. This is why we're here. This is why we care. This is why we work so hard. And to get students from a pre-A1 or wherever they are today up to that B2 level is what will be the level that will provide the opportunity for them. And at the end of the day, that's what we're working for. We're working for opportunity for students. Thank you for spending this time with me and I would love to answer any questions or your comments. Right. Wonderful, thank you very much, Carol. Um, before we move into the, to the Q&A time, and if you don't mind, I would like just to share with everyone uh, the links that we are providing now, okay? So that you can actually either request the, um, I'm just trying to find here, sorry, sharing my screen with everyone right now, uh, because we are getting a lot of, um, getting a lot of requests, okay? So I'm going to share the link in just here. We've been asking. We've been asked before we go into the more um, pedagogical questions. We've been asked about first of all where they can. Some teachers are still asking where would they can get the, the, the login account, the free 
accounts and also how they can get the recording link for later. So in your screen now you have, so first of all, remember that you and yours, and there's a typo there, I'm sorry, I just put that up now and I didn't even uh, double check, but I will be very happy to do it very quickly because I'm, um, I do not like that kind of very easy to solve mistakes. Okay, you and your students. Okay, remember that you and your students can get a free my own account at, there is the link, all right? I will also copy and paste again in the chat window so that you can just follow the link if necessary. This will be valid until June 30th and you can get the account and use it as much as you want. It's a free account, it means it is limited. It's a shared account, just students where you can read all the books that Carol just shared with all of you, okay? And if you want to receive either the recording link or the certificate um, of participation for this session, you need to follow that link that is CAP sensitive. Please, CJ for Carol Johnson is um, CAP sensitive. So use capital letters for that. You can just complete the form with your details. So we need a complete name, we need school, and we also need your email so that we can send you the certificate of participation if that is the case. This will um, account for two hours of professional development. Uh, please allow one to two weeks for certificates to be issued and sent. Uh, after that, there might be a problem, so you can reach out to us. We will also share our emails at the end. And right now, I think we can um, address questions that were um, asked during your presentation, Carol. So, um, Grace, would you like to start? Yes, I do have one question. It says, how often do students have to use English in third and, and I'm sorry, in three and six ages to develop a good comprehension? Um, I'm not sure I understand what three and six ages means. I would Between say, ages three and six? I, I would say so, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> well, um, obviously in the native language, it's all the time. <laughs> so, so the one thing about younger students is it's, I mean, they just seem to absorb it. We all know that. Um, if you're talking about um, using these Mayan books, you know, if, if they would um, be on them, you know, five, 10 minutes at a time, two or three times a day, that would be amazing. And you would see a difference from them. But not longer than they'll pay attention to it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because, it, because more than time, what matters is time spent absorbing. Exactly. Yeah. Um, there's also, it is, they say, it is important to start uh, since kids are born to have a real bilingual level. Um, can you expand on that? They just wrote, is it important to start since kids are born to have a real bilingual level? You mean, do you need to start from birth on? Exactly. No, no. Um, you know, there's really good research that says that people can continue to learn languages um, well through uh, adulthood. <laughs> I'll say even my age. Um, and the, the one thing that usually happens is certainly the later you learn it, then you tend to have less of a native accent, right? or you tend to have uh, a little bit um, non-native grammar, but the ability to function still, uh, learn language and function in it well, it goes well into adulthood. If you start earlier, then you tend to have the ability to pick up the, the accent, you know, it's yeah. just true. You can still develop the sound system much more clearly and you, and you tend to be more grammatical in your speech. Exactly. There's also, um, well, uh, they made this question, if they don't understand, they don't learn, but they were doing this question while you were explaining, you know, that uh, if we don't have background knowledge, it's di more difficult for us to understand what we're reading, right? It was Correct. just at the same time that you were explaining those things that they typed this question. So I also believe that now that you were showing this kind of books, they were asking where can they get these books? And of course you can get them through the Mayan library. Those are all Mayan books. Exactly. Those are all Mayan books. And we should always remember that we should never judge a book by its cover because sometimes teachers believe that if they look at the cover and they see cartoons or something that would look very childish, they believe that the content is very uh, low, that they have a, com a very low complexity. And that's not true. 
right? Especially grammatically, especially grammatically, and in terms of vocabulary. Because the thing is, I think it's important to realize that in our native languages, we all know uh, roughly 5,000 words by the time we're five years old. You know, I mean, that's just the truth. That's native language development all over the world. So if you're talking about starting to learn a langu another language and you don't start until you're five years old, which if you are five, you're very fortunate if you're starting at that age, to be honest, um, then that means that you are not going to be able to understand the same books as a native speaker at that time. So the, I think the focus needs to be, how do we help build language rather than what does the text look like? Mm -hmm. And if the, if the purpose is to build language, then you have a different mindset in terms of using text. I will share with you that um, I taught adult um, ESL in the United States for 10 years. And in those classrooms, it's very common for there to be children's books. And that's because of the, the reduction of vocabulary and, and um, ease of grammatical structure in many of them. But in their, in their case, they know that they are learning language. They know that's not a reflection of their intellect. And it's, so I think it's important that all of our students realize that learning language is not a reflection on how smart you are. It has nothing to do with that. It's just now we're learning a new skill. Exactly. Uh, here is another question. Elena is asking, how can we know how many words do our students know to choose the proper book? So what you probably know is the words that you've taught. As, and, and I'll share with you, it took me a lot, and I think this is implied in your question, if not, just ignore me. But um, as again, as someone who taught language for a long time, it took me many years to realize there was a big difference between the what I taught them and what they learned. <laughs> and when I say that, I mean what they learned long term. I'm not saying that I couldn't get them to to do well on a test at the end of the week. I'm saying, you know, retain that language. So what you know is what they you have taught them. Um, I mean that's. If you know more than that, then you have more access to information than, than I did when I taught. Um, what is probably the most important thing you can do with Mayan then is to go through Mayan books that reflect what um, are, uh, are similar to what you've already taught them so that you can help them get um, the experience of reading books that, were, that are authentic materials made for native speakers. And they can see how that, again, supports what they learned even though they may not articulate that. And you can see how then you can move to other books to help them learn more language based on the foundation that you know they have. So to answer your question, I don't know any way to know that. <laughs> that was a long answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> but also, uh, so another teacher is, was also um, uh, answering while you were uh, talking about this. And of course, uh, Patricia Aguilar says that also kids should have been taken a placement test, right? And that's also something that can help us to know exactly uh, their reading skill. Not only, you know, the number of words that the students need to know, but we need to know, first of all, their reading skill, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Unless you're just going to use it as a listening product. Yes, of course. Right. Uh, so you could, you, could, you, you could use it that way, like, just like parents read to children books that, you know, children can't read yet, you know. Um, you could use my own that way too if you had much younger children. Exactly. Well, let me just go through some of the other question. I don't know. What it, uh, Guillermo is asking, what it should be measured in how to choose a reading according with students' age? Um, Guillermo, I don't. Yeah, personally, I mean, so is that a question about the appropriateness of content or how much language English they know. Guillermo, can you please unmute your mic so you can uh, explain a little bit more your your question? Yes, yeah. thank you. Just the question was related to how can I measure as a teacher what is the right reading according to the student's age? Because you know you might find as a teacher a good a good reading that you say that that might be a good for my students, but. Uh, how can I measure, or how, how can I decide what it could be, or what it could be the elements to choose a good reading for students according to, to their age? That would be my question. Well, 
I'm not sure I know how to answer that. Um, I mean, I think that, so I think that's more a question of appropriateness of the book as opposed to the language, the, how much English they know. Do I understand you, Guillermo, right on that? Sorry, yes, uh, yes, it, it goes for the same line that you just told me, but this is the thing, how uh, you, you might choose a book based on the things that, that, that you know from them or the things that you know as a teacher. But the question was just ba basically how we can choose a good, in, in, in that case, according to your answer, how we can choose a good book for reading according to a student's age. I mean, it's something tricky because sometimes you might say this could be a good book according to the things that you know as a teacher or according to the things that you know from your students, but it's always tricky to choose a good book. I agree. I think, you know, so for me, I think the number one thing is to, is to find out what a student's interested in. I think that's the starting point for picking a book for a student. Personally, I'm just giving my own bias here. Um, and and I'll, I'll tell you why I tend to go with that. And I'm not sure that that's age related, but that would be that the student, what the student would share with you would be from his perspective at that age, his or her perspective at that age. But the reason I think that's the good starting point is that I'm back to the research on what makes input comprehensible, and that is knowing enough vocabulary and knowing enough about the topic. Because I think that when you're saying that what's a good book to pick for a student, what you really are saying, implying, is what's a good book to pick for a student that the student will like and want to read and understand. It's kind of, do I understand you correctly there, Guillermo? Guillermo? Yes, Carol, thank you very much. Okay, me so a, that, a that's, how I would that's how I would approach it personally. The other thing I, um, that I think is, is kind of a, an important thing about Mayan, and then it's back to the successful reading of it, meaning they understood it, is there's those, it comes with questions afterwards that are really great to give you a sense of that. But I'm not sure you asked that question, so ignore that for now. <laughs> um, so Thank you, Carol. Carol. You're welcome. Re regarding these questions, I believe that also the uh, Mayon um, with its full ca capabilities, so full account of Mayon, where some, uh, some teachers are mentioning the Lexile, that is really mm -hmm. important. So as a teacher before, we, uh, we also had some learning platforms and it was also very difficult to uh, match students' uh, reading ability and materials because it's not just a matter of age appropriateness Correct. or grade appropriateness because they read at different levels. So once you actually use Mayon um, and use the Lexiles framework for testing students and matching them to reading materials, the, the questions you're having now almost go, all of them go away. Uh, once they, te they get tested with um, the same point system that books are labeled with, it's very easy for students to read. So just using the ZPD, so respecting a little bit of the, the, the ZPD so that they can actually read within their Lexile range. This helps a lot. And by default, teachers don't need to worry now about which book am I going to choose, but um, let me guide them to find the best books for them independently. And this is really important. So I just posted um, a video, a YouTube video about Lexile for teachers who are not familiar with Lexile. If you want to le learn more about it, this is probably a very simple video, five minutes of your time, and you will understand that actually this helps a lot. Again, uh, if you're using uh, free, uh, the free Mayan accounts that are available, they are limited. S students cannot take the, the placement uh, test for Lexile. But if you are using Lex uh, Mayan with a full account, then they can take a Lexile test. And you can probably testify the same thing that I do with it, just it's really, use, really easy to use and really fun to use as well. So we have one more question here, Grace. Um, I'm going to address now, I think this question was from uh, Miguel, right? Uh, hand up, hands up, sorry. Uh, Miguel's question is, you have recommended factual books, but I have found that kids of around 10 to 11 years old find much more appealing fantasy books. So instead of nonfiction, kids like to read fiction books and general story books. So would you recommend one gender over the other, Carol, in this aspect? Um, 
No, I, um, they're all good. <laughs> I mean, I think that, that it comes back to what, are the, what is the individual student like, and that's kind of the beauty of this. They select books on their own. Um, you can guide books for them, but they also can select books on their own, and, you know, kids are individuals. Yeah. yeah. Usually, the, I'll, I'll share with no you the book reason. No book is a bad book, I, right? <laughs> yeah. If a, kid, if a child will read it and understand it, there's no such thing as a bad one. Okay. Uh, any more questions that we can clarify if you want to post questions? So, Miguel, I hope that your question was answered. If you have, yeah, okay, great. Uh, Aldair Vasquez has a um, hand raised. I'm not sure if there is a question here. I don't know if you noticed, uh, Nuno and Carol, but well, Carol, you are not watching, the, you are not reading the chat, but Nuno, I don't know if you noticed, but we have a lot of uh, teachers that really. I mean, I'm really into my own, and they know a lot about, about my own, you know, about the libraries, about Lexiles, and that makes me so happy. Um, uh, Ro Rosie, Ado, you're saying that you're always trying to balance well materials and suggestions from my own, but that it is hard to invite students to read if they have no interest doing it. I suggest, Rosie, that now that we have my own news uh, included in the platform, maybe you should start also with those because I know that not every single kid likes to read books, like, I mean, per se, right? So maybe another smart way to start reading or to make them read just by the pleasure of reading is maybe go through the articles that we have right now in my own news because they are shorter, they have videos, they have pictures, and maybe that's another way to start, you know, reading with the kids. And maybe that way, you know what, that at the end of the article, you have suggestions for the books that could help you to, um, uh, how can I say, to have more information about the article so that may be another kind of, you know, another way to help or to, um, uh, to make kids start reading in a more uh, frequently way. Yeah, yeah, Rosie saying that, yes, she has started to use my own and it's a great opportunity. Yes, I know, I love, I love my own news. I was going to ask something. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I think that it was a great conference, just a, a little bit just to get to know this. For example, with my students, what I do is I usually play them music and I check the lyrics on YouTube. And that's the way that they, well, in my case, that I taught them how to read. I was going to ask you that if, if it's a good way or, or if it could, it could be better. It could I... really help them. I understood something about lyrics and music. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you uh, quite well. I don't know if you, Carol or Nuno. Did you say, was that, was, sorry. did you say you use music to help the lyrics for language? I use the music and the lyrics as well. Okay, I think that's really smart. <laughs> I just need to tell you that. Um, the reason is that music is a subdominant function of the brain and so is picking up the sound system. And as a result, you, you should see really good improvement in both pronunciation and grammatical structure because things flow together in the, when that happens. When I never tell them in the book, I just tell them by music with lyrics and that's it. Yeah, it's really beneficial. Thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, I've noticed also that the link is working pretty well right now, right, Nuno? Yes, so apparently just Bitly uh, decided not to be working right now. So I'm posting uh, the link directly in the chat. So feel free to just follow that link. You can just leave the details so that we can issue the certificate of participation for the professional development. Um, there will be uh, two hours uh, included and uh, also you can record the recording link in case you just joined the session too late or you missed something. I'm, my, my internet connection is always dropping so sometimes I miss a bit. So the, the recording will be available probably tomorrow. The certificates will be issued um, within the next uh, one or two weeks and you will receive it directly in your email. So make sure that you type your email correctly. There are two confirmation fields to make sure that there is no uh, mistake because we would hate to not be able to send you the, the certificates and that would be that would be a shame <laughs> okay 
Uh, are there any other questions that anyone would like to, to ask? Um, if in case you join a bit later, there will be a second session um, in a few hours, I think in uh, four hours from now, Just right? Just Connie is asking, John, Connie Vallejo is saying, please try to organize these webinars later. We always have these webinars twice a day, Connie, one in the morning and the other one it's in the afternoon. So, um, uh, so you can choose uh, any of the sessions that you uh, prefer, right? The other one right. is at uh, five, I don't, I'm sorry. It starts in four hours. Yeah, so don't so, worry. So four hours from now, if you wanna join because you missed part of it, feel free to do so, all right? We would be happy to. So where do you register? Okay, one more question, which I'm happy to, to share. So um, some teachers are asking again about where to register for the free my own accounts this is the link that i'm just going to type in your chat okay this will be valid until again all valid until 30th of june so you have over one month of free usage for this one um, you can read all the books that are available in the, in the international section as well as my own news so maybe later uh we can spare a little bit of a few minutes just to show you the the actual uh, website, how it looks, because Carol very kindly shared with us the um, part of the books that are available on Mayon, but we didn't have the time to look into exactly how these books look like live. And this is, the books are interactive, the books are very engaging. So are Mayon News. So you can also use the news articles to teach the five W's one H, which is something also very interesting and um, you know, plenty of books, over 5,000. So um, maybe we can spare a little bit of time. We are, we are reaching our one hour limit, uh, but in the second, second session, we will make sure that we also go through a little bit of the website itself so that any questions can be answered. Uh, here's another question, uh, Vestave. No, if your daughter is not registered in my own, you can't have an individual account for your kid. Uh, your school has, to have it, but why don't you just contact me? I will uh, type here my um, my cell phone number. Wait. Okay, uh, um, Grace, can yeah. I share my screen because there, everything okay. will be there? Yeah, please. Yeah? Okay, wonderful. So I will share the screen with all the details that we have, both from Grace and myself, so you can. Thank you very much. There it is. Yeah, okay, thank so you very much. So you write you down can... emails and Phone numbers, you can WhatsApp us for sure. Okay, we will be happy to answer any questions you might have. Exactly. Um, to just let us know what you need, uh, for example, because I noticed that there are some schools right here that are new into my own. So if you need webinars or like special sessions, you can also ask for them. Just Definitely. take send an, uh, a WhatsApp so we can schedule it for you guys and uh, we will happily do them. Okay, so if we have no other questions, we would like to thank you very much for the time to be to watch this webinar, Carol. It was delightful. Actually, I learned a lot today. Uh -huh. There's another. <laughs> and, I'm sorry, no, no. Oh, oh Miguel, we have another question. Great. I'm sorry. Uh, Miguel says, "I would like to ask about comic books. Taking into account the pictures input, are they useful even if they don't know 90% of the vocabulary?" Okay, uh, Carol, would you like to answer so, that? Yeah. So um, if they know enough to understand it, then they're useful. Definitely. There are a lot of comics in, in my own, and I, um, that's one, of exa one, one example that I was working with the last, I don't know, two or three days ago, I don't remember exactly, we were talking about comics because they were asking for books for secondary. So I show them the comics, you know, that we have the cell, uh, we have um, photosynthesis, and we have all these topics that are more for uh, secondary grades. So um, they found them pretty uh, appealing, you know, because that's a different way to, to make kids understand uh, maybe different topics. And I would say that, yes, of course, Miguel, um, I would say that comics are very useful. They're more attractive. They're more appealing yeah. for kids, right? So I think you're now seeing my 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 own account, right? Yes, we are. So 
when you log in, the first thing you can check here in the browse menu is graphic novels, exactly because this is a favorite. And mm -hmm. for example, I taught many years in Asia and parents did not like their, their children to read comics because they thought it was a lower form of literature and they didn't want them to read. But my struggle was also always this, if they like to read comics, let them read the comics. At one point, they will, pro they will evolve to something more challenging, to something a bit more, um, uh, so I wouldn't say structured in terms of lit liter uh, literature, sorry. But why limit, why prohibit reading? Why forbid re reading when um, children want to read? So here you can see that we have 6,891 books available in the free account. And if you press graphic novels, you have 575 that are specifically just graphic novels. There are more that are a mix. So here you have it divided into different categories, but you can also search here. So once you reg register using the Richmond portal that I sent you, you can search books that are appropriate, all right? So you have from picture books all the way to teenager books. And these ones you can even check for the type of book you like to read any short medium. So there are a lot of filters. So we will, we will discuss a little bit of, about this later on in the second session as well. Uh, so if you wanna join, please feel free to do so. All right, and Carol and myself, we are running webinars for new users to help you also understand how to use this because it's a world in, in, inside a, a, a website, to be honest. There's a lot mm -hmm. of potential, there's a lot of options and features. And even for a limited account, it still might be a little bit too difficult to grasp everything at once. We're here to help you. You have our emails and phone numbers. Please feel free to do so. Okay, we, we will then discuss also my own news as well. And that's something very interesting. Okay, Grace, up, this is now up to you. Uh, well, I just have to thank everybody uh, for being here. I know that you teachers are doing a great job right now uh, working online with your students. And I really appreciate that. And of course, uh, uh, Carol, it's been a pleasure to have you, of course. Okay. Thank you very much. Nuno, thank you very much. See you later. <laughs> okay, see you. See you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you, you everyone. Thank you for being here. Okay, thank, thank you for watching. Nice to meet you. Thank Good you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, very much. thank you for the meeting. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. Okay. Right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much from Colegio Bilingual Noroeste Mexico. Stay safe and stay sane. <laughs> <laughs> very important these days. I would say yeah. so. The most difficult thing to do right now. Stay sane. <laughs> <laughs> Read. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you very Bye. much. God bless you. Thank from you.